Hi everyone. So in this video, we're going to continue looking at action potentials, but we're going to focus on how they're conducted down the axon. And then um, another aspect of action potentials we'll look at is the refractory period. And then we'll get into graded potentials. So let's get going. So in the last lecture, we learned how action potentials are propagated down the cell membrane in the action, axon portion of the neuron. Try saying that five times fast. Uh, now we're going to look at the method of, conduct, of conduction down the axon itself. So once the action potential is generated, how is that actually moving down the axon toward the axon uh, terminals? Right. So um, there's really two types of propagation for action potentials. One is called contiguous and the other is called saltatory. So these have to do with um, basically how fast they are and then also uh, the structure of the neuron that's, uh, that's been stimulated with the action potential. So um, uh, contiguous conduction is slower and so, and that's because the action potential spreads along every portion of the membrane. So really, if you think of a, an axon that is so long, um, every single gated channel that's on there, sodium and, and uh, potassium, they're all going to open and close. And so you're going to get several uh, action potentials running down the membrane, okay, because it has to do every single one. So if you think of it this way, if you have um, an action potential, say, takes two milliseconds to run, and there's going to be 100 action potentials that are produced, that means it's going to take 200 milliseconds for that to occur. Okay? Um, saltatory conduction are more rapid, and that's because there is a coating wrapped around different segments along the length of the axon, and so where that coating is, there are no voltage-gated channels there. So that means action potentials can't run there. It can only run in the gaps in between. Okay, And so therefore, if it can only run in specific places in between, then you're going to have less action potentials running. So an example of that is, let's say along the same length of axon, um, the, an action potential takes two milliseconds to run. But along this length, it's only able to run to stimulate 20 action potentials along the length. So therefore, that action potential to reach the end is only going to take 40 milliseconds. Okay. Um, so again, the reason why that's happening is because of a structure called myelination. So in neurons where contained contiguous conduction occurs, those fibers are unmyelinated, and in saltatory conduction, those fibers are myelinated. Okay, so I'm going to show you what myelin is on the next slide. Now, the numbers that I gave you for the speed and how many action potential runs, I just made those up for example's sake. Okay, so you don't have to memorize that there's a hundred. I don't know how many there are. I don't know that anyone knows exactly how many there are. But sometimes it's helpful to put simple numbers to, on something to explain that concept. Um, helps it get in your brain a little bit better. Always go to the easy math is what I say. Okay, so myelinated fibers. So a fiber is the actual axon that we're talking about because it looks like a long stringy fiber. Um, and many times then our nerves, the axons of different neurons will bundle up and that forms a nerve fiber, right? But each individual axon, if it's myelinated, that means that it has a cell associated with it and the cell flattens out and it wraps around like a coil around a segment of the axon. So in this picture here, you can see the axon is coming out towards you. That's the yellow portion in the middle. And then you see the darker yellow um, cell that's wrapped around it, okay? And so that's really, because the cell is flattened out, it's mainly a lot of cell membrane, 
right? And so that cell membrane that just kind of wrapped around there, but that cell membrane doesn't contain any um, uh, channels that allow sodium or potassium to move through. And even if it did, that's a thick portion that those ions need to move through. So it just doesn't happen that way, okay? And um, there are two types of cells that produce myelination. So if you had anatomy, you learned about these cells. So in our peripheral nervous system, so all the nerves that branch off of our brain and spinal cord, that's our peripheral nervous system. The cells that produce myelination there are called Schwann cells. And then in our brain and our spinal cord, the cells that wrap around the axons producing myelination are called oligodendrocytes. So two different cells, but they produce the same function. Let me just show you another picture here showing you myelination again. So there's the term Schwann cell. So again, the cell is flattened out, but you can still see the nucleus. And it starts to roll and wrap, coil around the axon. Okay, and um, so some people think of it in different ways. Some people, you think it's like a hot dog inside of a hot dog bun. The Schwann cell is a hot dog bun or the oligodendrocyte and the axon is the hot dog. Or some people like to think of it as a jelly roll and the axon is the jelly filling and the um, myelination is the pastry on the outside. Or um, I've heard cannolis. Um, I'm sure whatever your ethnic background, you can find a food that reminds you of this. So whatever works for you, use it. That helps you remember things, okay? Something sim familiar to you, okay? So um, before I explain how the myelination helps to speed up the conduction. Let me show you what happens without myelination. And that's what we see here. So this slide is indicating contiguous conduction. And so what we're seeing is we kind of opened up the axon. There are no cells wrapping around it, so there's no myelination. But you can see that the sodium entering and the potassium leaving, it's happening along several segments all along the um, inside of that axon. The inside membrane is depolarizing inside that axon. Okay, so again, that's going to take more time because you can actually get more um, action potentials occurring and each action potential takes time. So remember, the next action potential in a series has to get stimulated by the previous action potential. So this just takes a little more time to do that. So it slows down the conduction speed, and but that's okay. This especially happens in real short uh, neurons, those that have very short axons. So you don't need, the body doesn't need to build the extra cells, which takes energy to myelinate those types of axons. And then there are some areas of our bodies where we might want to slow down the conduction speed. Okay, so for saltatory conduction, again, the potential, the action potential that spreads down the membrane is actually faster. Not the individual action potential. Those are always the same, take the same amount of time. Always the same strength but how fast it moves down the axon is actually a little bit faster. So before I show you this slide, let me show you the picture and I'll come back to that. Because this picture, now you're looking at a cross section of the axon and it's also cut through the, the, this is an example of the Schwann cells. And to me that really looks like a hot dog and a hot dog bun. But one thing you should notice here is that the Schwann cells don't cover the entire length of the axon. They actually um, are, are, uh, have a starting and an ending point, and then there's a space. There's a gap. That's called a node, N-O-D-E. Um, you might hear that's called the node, nodes of Ranvier. Okay, so it's at this node where the cell membrane of the axon is exposed to the extracellular fluid and that's where our voltage-gated channels are located, okay? And so when a voltage-gated channel is stimulated to open and sodium comes in, you can see that sodium enters the axon, and then 
the, the nodes are actually close enough that sodium can flow through that axon and, and get to the next node with enough, enough concentration to stimulate that area of the membrane to threshold. So the, axon, uh, the action potential is going to run in that area. And then when that one takes place, enough sodium will come in and the space is short enough for the sodium to flow to the next node, stimulating the action potential in that area. So, so that's why the action potential can run down the axon. And again, it's faster because less action potentials are being produced over the same amount of time. And so that, or I'm sorry, oh, less action potentials are being produced and therefore it saves time. It allows that conduction then to speed down the, um, the axon into the uh, synaptic terminals. Okay, so if you imagine we remove those um, Schwann cells, then that would uncover other voltage gated channels so where that green sodium is there on the first one, it would actually be stimulating uh, voltage gated channels right next to it, right underneath where that Schwann cell is right now. And then another one, and then another one. And so that would just take a little bit more time. Um, so again, saltatory conduction, the action potential gets conducted faster down the length of the axon faster than what contiguous conduction would do, okay? And again, and that's because the AP is not being regenerated as many times. It skips it where the myelination occurs. So that causes uh, myelinated fibers to conduct impulses about 50 times faster than the unmyelinated fibers. And so imagine you actually have neurons that stretch from um, your spinal cord all the way down to your toe to move your toes. And that's a, um, a long distance for a cell, but it moves the conduction, the signal gets sent very, very quickly. And those, that's because those are myelinated fibers, okay? So again, the myelin itself, it's a cell, but it's flattened. And so it doesn't have as much space inside for the cytoplasm and everything else. So it's really kind of, the cell membranes on either side flatten together. So therefore, it's mostly composed of lipids. It's that phospholipid bilayer. And again, so there's the terms oligodendrocytes that uh, produces myelination in the central nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord. And Schwann cells produce the myelination in your, in your nerves. So that's in the, the peripheral nervous system. So um, again, here's just kind of showing the neuron again with the um, Schwann cells around them. This picture, you can really see the nodes in between them really well. And so uh, the action potential, it shows you there the direction of conduction. Okay, so it, the direction that action potentials run down an axon is always from the cell body toward the axon terminals or the synaptic terminals, okay? It's always a one-way conduction. And you might be thinking, but wait, I just saw in that other picture that why can't the sodium go backwards and depolarize where it just came from? So I'm gonna explain to you uh, in a minute why that is. So again, this brings us to those principles of action potentials. We already talked about the all or nothing principle. Okay, so again, action potentials occur once they're stimulated, they will complete the depolarization, repolarization, hyperpolarization rest. They will complete that whole segment. Okay, so they'll, they'll, that's all. Um, or nothing means that um, if it isn't stimulated to threshold, then the action potential won't run. So that has to do with something, what's stimulating it, and, and that's what we're gonna get to um, later in this lecture, okay? Uh, the other thing, so the strength of the stimulus depends on whether that action potential is going to run or not. And then also, um, 
the action potential cannot run backwards. Okay, and so part of that is going to be because of the um, refractory period and the changing of the gates, the activation gate and the inactivation gate. Remember, I used that term before explaining an action potential. So that term inactivation gate should give you a clue as to why it can't run backwards. So don't worry, I'm going to get a little more detail in that right now. Okay, so we're going to talk about refractory periods. And it also sets up a limit on, to, on how frequently an action potential can run. Okay, so zoom into this slide for you. So if refractory period, there's two types. So let me first explain this graph, and then we'll talk about those two types. So in the graph, you're seeing an action potential. Right? You should get familiar with this, this type of graph and that the, the different slopes, the rising, the falling, and the, and the little dip um, and coming back up. So you can see toward the left of the graph at negative 70 millivolts, we're at resting membrane potential. Then it depolarizes and it um, stops depolarizing at about positive 30. And that's because our voltage-gated sodium channel is closed. Then it falls back down in the repolarization phase because now potassium channels have opened and um, potassium is moving out of the cell. So our positive ions are leaving the inside of the cell that just became positive because of the sodium ions. So again, this is about positive ions leaving. So the inside of the cell is going to become negative again. And remember there are more, pos or more uh, potassium channels open, both the leak channels and the voltage-gated channels. So because there's more open, they actually temporarily um, repolarize the cell past resting potential. So remember, that's called hyperpolarization. And then our sodium-potassium pumps bring us back to resting membrane potential. But notice in the first part of the action potential, and it's almost the entire uh, it is the entire depolarization phase and almost the entire repolarization phase. That area is colored kind of a yellow color, and that's indicating absolute refractory period. And that's because the membrane in this period cannot produce another action potential at this time. Um, and that's because our sodium channels are inactivated. This is the point where our... Um, an activation gate is swinging closed and then it, it is remaining closed. So it is inactivating the channel. The only thing that opens up the inactivation gate is just time. So during this period of time, even if a really strong signal came, it would not activate that, um, that voltage gated channel to open again. So this is called absolute refractory period, meaning that another action potential cannot be stimulated at this moment in time. So again, that's going to limit how frequently an action potential comes. Okay? Um, it's also then going to prevent any action potential from running backwards because if, let me go back to this pi picture and I'll come back here. This is a good picture. So if right in the middle at the lower picture, uh, you can see the one at the bottom, there's sodium entering at the bottom, at uh, entering toward the middle of that action axon right there. Um, as it enters, again, I mentioned sodium just flows throughout the cytoplasm there. I kind of said that it flows toward the right because that's where the um, uh, synaptic terminal is, in actuality, it flows all over. So it can flow back to the left. Okay. However, the voltage-gated sodium channels in that node to the left, they're in absolute refractory period right now. So even if that sodium uh, re-stimulated that area, brought it to threshold, it doesn't matter. That activate that channel is inactivated and so it cannot start another action potential 
So, but the sodium flowing toward the right, those voltage gated channels are ready to open. Only the activation gate is closed. So as those sodium channels move in that direction and depolarize that segment of the cell, you're gonna get an action potential running there. Okay, so again, that's in that's uh, absolute refractory, meaning we absolutely cannot open those uh, uh, or stimulate those voltage-gated sodium channels um, because they're in a refractory period. And again, that's about the activation gate and the inactivation gate, what position that they're in. The inactivation gate is closed. Okay, so you can see that's during most of the action potential time through most of the uh, um, repolarization phase. In that blue segment, that's a segment where the cell is becoming hyperpolarized. So during this segment, the, um, the, the voltage-gated sodium channels have reset, so the inactivation gate is open and the activation gate is closed. Um, so it, it can be opened, but it has to reach threshold again. But look at in this period, we have, a, a because of the potassium um, ions are still leaving, we're hyperpolarizing. So relative refractory period means that um, those sodium channels can be stimulated to open, but it has to be a stronger stimulus because it has to move to get to threshold the negative 50, it has to move from below 70, right? So before, the, from 70 to 50, that's a change of 20. Now it's gonna have a change of 21 to 30, okay, if it gets down to negative 80. So again, relative refractory period means it can open, but you need a stronger signal to do it. Okay, so some kind of stronger stimulus is gonna come along and then you can open it. And that's when maybe somebody's poking you even harder and you feel that your, your brain interprets the more frequent action potentials coming as a stronger stimulus, as a stronger poke. Okay, you feel that differently. Okay, so that's refractory periods, uh, two kinds, absolute refractory and relative refractory Absolute means the voltage-gated sodium channels cannot open because the inactivation gate is closed. And it just takes timing for that to swing back open and the activation gate to close again. Now it's ready to be stimulated. And that can happen during relative refractory, but it's still a refractory period because we are hyperpolarized. So it's going to take a stronger stimulus to get us back to um, uh, the threshold. Okay. So that's how a neuron sends a signal down the length of its axon. Okay, that it uses a p action potential to do that. So all or nothing, they're always the same strength, they have a refractory period. Another type of potential change is called a graded potential. Because notice on this picture, I kept talking about that the action potential to be stimulated has to happen at that space between the cell body and the axon, and that is at the axon hillock. So something is stimulating the axon hillock, it's causing a change of potential there, and it, ha it's, it has to change that potential to negative 50, and then the action potentials will run. So what's causing that to become negative 50? Well, that's the graded potential. So that's a signal that's flowing over those dendrites, those short projections coming off the cell body, or the cell body itself. So this is a change in the membrane potential along the membranes of the dendrites and the cell body. And remember I said that graded potentials can vary in strength. They can be weak or they can be strong. Well, if they're too weak, then that means the membrane at the axon hillock won't reach negative 50 and we won't get our action potential running. So let's look at 
how how graded potentials work um, and and get a feel for how they can vary in strength and therefore we'll understand when an action potential can be triggered so again very important to remember graded means change differences okay graded can be strong or weak okay it's varying grades or degrees of magnitude of strength okay um, so, for example, a change in the cell membrane from negative 70 to negative 60, that's just a 10 millivolt potential. That's very weak. That didn't get us to, um, that didn't get us to threshold. If it goes from negative 70 to negative 50, that's a stronger potential, change in potential. So the graded potential varies, okay? The stronger the trigger, the larger the graded potential. Okay, so the trigger will open another ion, ion channel, sorry. And these ion channels are usually scattered throughout the different areas of the membrane. Um, and only in that area where that channel opens will the ion flow through. It's again, it's usually sodium, but the trigger to open that channel, it's not electricity anymore. It's actually uh, a chemical, <clears throat> okay? So that's why in the slide there you see CG sodium channel. CG means chemically gated. Alrighty, um, so let, let's look more closely at that so you can understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so this slide, um, the picture they use here looks like an axon, but think of it as a dendrite. So a dendrite is also a projection that uh, merges into the cell body. They're also kind of tubular in shape. This could also be the cell body, but it's probably easier for the uh, illustrators to draw uh, a dendri dendrite instead of tube. Okay, so what you see there at the top is a chemically gated sodium channel. And um, I'm sorry this is kind of small, but you can use your textbook or even just uh, Google it. And what you would see at the very top is a space for a molecule to attach to. That's the chemical. That's why it's chemically gated. In this case, it's usually a neurotransmitter or a hormone or something like that. Okay, so once that binds to the outside, that opens the channel. And that's what you see in the second picture there. When that opens, it's a sodium channel, so specific to sodium. So just like before, sodium is more abundant outside the cell than inside. So it moves along its concentration gradient into the cell. And again, you can see those positive ions just diffuse throughout the cytoplasm. Okay, And as it diffuses throughout the cytoplasm, um, it it causes that segment of the membrane, you can see it's a little highlighted there, it's a little darker. That segment of the membrane now is depolarized, okay? But if those ions keep flowing outward and they start to, to um, flow away from one another, then that means they'll have less of an ability to depolarize the membrane because they're flowing out um, and moving away from each other, so that's less of a signal. So the signal then becomes degraded the further away you get from the actual site where the channel is. Okay, so let's think about that. Let me go back to this picture because I want to give you another analogy. So just look at this ion or this neuron here. It's colored blue and that looks like a pool. So we're up at the um, cell body, the pool and you're standing there and you're throwing in uh, little floaties into the pool, something that floats. And you're just kind of standing in one spot, throwing them in one at a time. Okay, and maybe you stop now. Well, those floaties have to flow all the way from where you're standing at the end of the pool, all the way over to, to float on its own to the axon hillock. Okay, but if only one or two make it over there, that's not enough to reach threshold. So your action potential won't run. But if you can throw more in there and we can keep your gate open longer and throw more and more floaties, then there's a larger chance that more of those will flow to the axon hillock, reaching 
threshold potential at negative 50. Another way we can do it, rather than keeping it open, because that's going to require more of the chemical, like the neurotransmitter, more of that to keep it open, maybe you have more gates, more sodium channels, or more friends that are surrounding the pool, and you're all throwing floaties in. So if you're all throwing floaties in, that means more of them are in the pool and more of them have a chance to reach the axon hillock, causing that threshold to occur, which will trigger your action potential. So in this case, again, the floaties are sodium ions. So the sodium ions have to be able to be abundant enough to continue depolarizing the membrane until it get, reaches the axon hillock to that one area. Okay, here's another um, picture that kind of shows that. And it shows you that at the site of where the gate opens, the thicker arrow means that there's more charge occurring inside of there. Okay, because that's where the sodium is concentrating. But as they start to flow away, they're not as concentrated, so that's causing less of a membrane potential. So that's, it's degrading, decremental spread of the graded potential. So it is spreading along the membrane, but it's degrading, it's not as strong, okay? So again, the magnitude or how strong the graded potential is varies directly with the magnitude of the triggering event. So whatever is opening that gated channel, we need more of that. So it has to be more of a, maybe another nerve is continuously releasing neurotransmitter to open more. We'll also see, again, there are more of these voltage gated channels around the surface membrane of the cell body and the dendrites. So if more neurons are stimulating all those areas, and um, more neurotransmitters spreading across the cell membrane, then more of those channels were open and you'll get more sodium inside the cell and that increases the strength of the graded potential. And so if it's strong enough to depolarize the membrane at the axon hillock to at least negative 50, then our action potential will run. Okay, so again, that's kind of, that's how we control um, um, if a neuron is firing, we might translate that into a sense. We're feeling something, we're smelling something, we're touching something, um, we're seeing something. But if the triggering event is not strong enough, then we won't see it, we won't smell it, we won't taste it, we won't hear it. Okay. All right, so um, here is just to kind of summarize again with our graded potentials okay the stronger a triggering event the larger the resultant graded potential that's different than action potentials it doesn't matter as long as the triggering event is at least negative 50 millivolts then the action potential will run it doesn't matter if it's stronger than negative 50 the action potential will run at the same strength so a difference there. Graded potential spread by passive current flow. So again, remember those ions have to flow throughout the cell membrane. Okay. Graded potentials can die over short distances. Again, the, the, um, not only do the sodium ions just kind of dissipate, just like my analogy in the pool with the floaties, okay, the potassium leak channels are constantly working and so potassium is constantly moving out of the membrane so remember that's positive ions leaving and um, it's it's uh, repolarizing the membrane again so it's decremental it means it gradually decreases but if it's strong enough then graded potentials trigger an action potential okay and this picture or this table is in your book and it, it goes through, sorry, it goes through um, uh, the difference between a graded potential and an action potential. And so um, this might help you kind of keep straight what is the difference between a graded potential and an action potential. 
So now we've got electricity. We know how it moves through the dendrites and the cell membrane. We know how electricity then is propagated down the axon. Now we have to find out what happens at the um, synaptic terminal. And then from there, how does it st stimulate the next cell in a series? So that'll be the next uh, video lecture. Thank you.